Medical science generally accepts the electric nature of life and this understanding is used every day by doctors. In intensive care, for example, when you're looking for the absence or presence of life on somebody who's ventilated, so you can't use the normal outward clinical signs, we might look at the EEG, the electroencephalogram, or the ECG, the electrocardiogram, and the waves that you see on these, they're electromagnetic waves showing us the intrinsic electromagnetic nature of the body. And put very simply, without it, there is no life. With it, there is signs of life. All the chemical reactions in our bodies are actually mediated by electric charge. There are chemical messengers involved, but it's an electrical signal that basically goes through the nervous system. And the electrical activity precedes the chemical activity and controls it. Even our perception of the world is based on electrical signals. We often imagine that light, sound, smells and taste directly enter the brain in order to create our sensory experience. But what we sense as reality is really an elaborate and highly complex network of electrical impulses. Photons entering through the eyes, compressed air entering through the ears, molecules of food on the tongue, molecules from the air, and physical contact with any part of the body are all converted into electrical signals. Electricity is the currency of the brain. The brain can only make sense of what our senses experience by converting all of the different sensory inputs into electrical signals. One of the most dramatic illustrations of the electric nature of the brain can be seen in the work of Dr. Jose Delgado, a neurophysiologist who was at Yale University from 1946 to 1974. In the 1960s, Dr. Delgado showed that he was able to remotely control the behavior of a charging bull. By connecting a radio antenna to electrodes inserted inside the bull's brain, Dr. Delgado was able to stop the bull from charging by simply pressing a button on a remote controller. The electrical signal immediately switched off the bull's aggression. But does the electric nature of life run even deeper than this? For more than 600 years, scientists have postulated the existence of electric or electromagnetic fields that govern all life. In the 15th century, Paracelsus, one of the most influential medical scientists in Europe at the time, referred to an entity that presides over the growth and form of all living things. Isaac Newton and others postulated the existence of cosmic ether that either acted as a medium for electromagnetic radiation or directly consisted of electromagnetic fields. Mesmer related health to the regulation of weightless fluids in the body and wrote about animal magnetism, which was described as the basis of all sensation connecting the individual to the whole universe. The concept of a controlling biofield persisted for centuries, and various attempts were made to define it. In more recent times, Harold Saxton Burr, professor of anatomy at Yale University School of Medicine, began experiments to actually measure the biomagnetic field associated with living organisms. Professor Burr strongly believed that the electromagnetic properties of living things represented an organizing field that kept living tissue from falling into a chaotic state. He called this the life field. The easiest way to imagine this life field is to think about the way iron filings behave when placed near a magnetic field. When iron filings are sprinkled on a surface that's in contact with a bar magnet, they naturally arrange themselves to reveal the previously unseen magnetic field. In a similar way, Burr's life field acts as the unseen field providing the structure that living things adhere to. Professor Burr completed a number of sophisticated experiments using specially developed equipment that was capable of detecting very small changes in voltage. He found that measurable changes took place in the life field prior to the appearance of a physical illness, 
and voltage changes in the life field closely correlated with growth, development and different mental states. Work in this area was advanced further by orthopaedic surgeon Robert Becker. Dr. Becker was interested in a wide range of electromedical applications. In addition to advancing the work of Harold Burr, Dr. Becker also further developed the theory of the current of injury. When the body was uh, cut or traumatized in some way, the area near that uh, disturbance showed a small current. And uh, this was something that uh, lay around as a scientific fact for many years until it was resurrected, in a sense, by Bob Becker, who thought of this as perhaps uh, being something more than just a casual observation and began to uh, use this as a method of uh, regeneration, for example, in animals. He used salamanders and actually uh, regenerated uh, some tissues in rats. The uh, idea was that there was some sort of electrical system in the body that not only uh, registered these currents, but then used them as a means of coming back to equilibrium. Dr. Becker discovered that animals possessing the ability to regrow their limbs, such as the salamander, undergo remarkable changes in voltage after injury. After amputation, the voltage at the cut end of the stump is always positive. In animals that do not have the ability to regrow their limbs, the voltage drifts back to zero during the next few days as the wound heals. However, in the salamander, the voltage swings from positive to negative, and it's this negative voltage that's associated with the regrowing of the limb. Many of these wonderful creatures have so brilliantly adapted that they can regenerate entire limbs at will. Remarkably, Dr. Becker was able to use this understanding of the current of injury to mimic nature by applying external electric fields to the site of an injury. We're trying to harness this capability and transfer it into our host subject. In this way, Dr. Becker was able to regrow limbs in animals that do not normally have the ability to self-generate. An idea that has been borrowed by Hollywood. Another significant contributor to the field of bioelectricity was Bjorn Nordenstrom. Dr. Nordenstrom is recognized as a brilliant pioneer in his field, diagnostic radiology. For example, in the 1950s, he developed fine needle biopsies to diagnose lung cancer. At the time, it was considered a revolutionary idea, but today it is used routinely throughout the world. He also pioneered, in the 50s, the techniques that led to the first X-ray pictures of the insides of blood vessels in the lungs. In the 60s, he was named Chief of Diagnostic Radiology here at the world-renowned Karolinska Hospital. And three years ago, he served as chairman of the assembly that chooses the Nobel Prize winners in medicine. Dr. Nordenstrom believes that the body is filled with electric circuits and that current travels through vessels and tissues just like they were electrical cables. The current can travel long distances through blood vessels or short distances through the walls of the capillaries into and out of surrounding tissues. When Dr. Nordenstrom places electrodes inside and outside the tumors and runs a charge between them, he believes he can manipulate these electrical forces to kill the tumor. He attacks the tumors with a current running between two electrodes, one in the tumor and one outside the tumor. Despite having impeccable credentials, Professor Nordenstrom, Professor Burr, Dr. Becker, and others were mostly ignored by the medical community. This was most likely because earlier attempts at electromedicine were much less scientific. Thank you. 
The article I read said it would help for sure. The electric belt was sold as the common sense treatment for the weak man to cure everything from cancer to impotency. And uh, it was quackery. But at the time, you could also go to the medicine show in a carnival fashion where they have colored alcohol uh, water that they're, they're claiming is, is going to cure everything. So those were not legitimate drugs and those were not legitimate devices. At the start of the 20th century, Abraham Flexner undertook an assessment of medical education in North America by visiting all 155 medical schools then in operation. Flexner was not a physician, but a respected research scholar. Therefore, his critique of medical education in America was from the perspective of an educator rather than a practicing doctor. Flexner criticized the medical education system at the time for being unscientific. Certainly, there was a need for treatments to be based on a more solid scientific grounding. However, some doctors have argued that Flexner placed too much emphasis on the implementation of a hyper-rational education system that neglected the art of caring and the role of the physician as a healer. Flexner was influenced by the way medical education was implemented in Germany at the time. This system viewed patients as existing to serve the purposes of the professors rather than the other way around. Flexner also strongly favoured the biochemical model of disease and outlawed all treatments that were not based on pharmaceuticals. Flexner's recommendations were widely accepted because he had the support, financial and otherwise, of the Carnegie Foundation and John D. Rockefeller. Both nutritional medicine and electromedicine were forced out of medical practice after the Flexner Report was published in 1910. The Flexner Report organized medicine in the, foundationally in the manner it's, it's organized today. So, the, the, so Abraham Flexner and uh, Rockefellers and the Carnegies back then uh, uh, pretty much set up the pharmaceutical industry as the um, basis of health care. Drugs would be the basis and everything else was quackery, nutritional therapy. I mean, even in the 1980s, my mother had cancer, and I, I spoke to her, her oncologist, and I said, I have her on a, a special diet that I think will help cancer. And he said, that's too bad. She should enjoy her food. It, it won't do a thing. And I'm thinking, that's just so illogical, because I'm a scientist. I'm trying to think things through. Uh, and, and that just didn't make any sense to me whatsoever, not to mention that I've seen diet cure cancer. So why not? add that to the, to, to the uh, treatment program. But think about it this way. 100 years ago, or uh, a little more than that, uh, I, can hold, I can hold something in this hand, and I can hold something in this hand. This is chemicals like a, the, that I can make a drug out of. This is energy. It's invisible. So, of course, the thought at the time was that the thing that you can hold, you can taste, you can, you can hear, you can smell, uh, you can feel, this, 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 this is real. This is not real what's in this hand, but it is. It's just as real as this. Dr. Kirsch, Daniel Kirsch, who's invented this little machine to make him quit hurting. Dr. Daniel Kirsch, a neurobiologist, designed the AlphaStem 2000 device and the home version, the AlphaStem 350, in 1981. And this new device actually uses electricity to control your pain. Dr. Daniel Kirsch has created a new machine called the AlphaStem 2000, a pain-relieving machine. Do you suffer from anxiety, insomnia, depression, or chronic pain, but you don't want to take drugs to treat your problem? Maybe the answer for you. CBS 2's Dr. Max Gomez shows us that it clips to your ears. No pills or invasive procedures, just a soothing 20-minute session with this, the AlphaStim. AlphaStim has been continuously developed during the last 36 years. The model released in 1981 was not quite as portable as the eighth generation device available today. AlphaStim is a form of cranial electrotherapy stimulation, or CES. 
CES involves the delivery of electrical stimulation through the skull by the attachment of electrodes. Since the brain is mostly electrical in nature, it can readily be modulated by electrical intervention. Alpha Stim is the most used and the most researched form of CES. In the 36 year history of Alpha Stim, uh, we estimate that there was uh, well over 15 million people treated. We use electricity and a very small amount of electricity, microcurrent, uh, which is millionths of an amp. And we use that in the brain to treat anxiety, insomnia, and depression. And we can also use the same current and same waveform on the body to treat pain peripherally. The Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration is using alpha stem cranial electrotherapy stimulation extensively for treating anxiety, uh, insomnia, and depression. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury. So we have seen about a 65% of our market in this country is to the government uh, for those uses. They do pain control as well, um, but the psychiatry market, the behavioral health market, psychologists are um, the, the most avid users of alpha stim for the brain stimulation. So how effective is alpha stim compared with the medications that are commonly used? Alpha stim cranial electrotherapy stimulation, stimulation of the brain. We put electrodes on the ear lobes to stimulate the brain. Um, is more effective and a heck of a lot safer. Alpha stim is subsensory. You you can you can set it so you don't feel it. Therefore, you can do double blind placebo crossover studies, which is the gold standard. Same as drugs. And what we can say is we don't pay for any research, it's done independent of us. So that keeps the bias um, out of it, at least from our end. We do supply them with devices if they want to do a study. So they have that and they don't have to pay for that out of pocket as part of their research fund. So they can just get the devices and then work on recruiting patients for the study. So many of the studies now are, are very gold standard. As it's grown in the last few years, uh, we see better and better facilities, uh, you know, higher end research facilities want to do studies. And we have a couple now underway at places like MD Anderson, uh, the Cancer Center in Houston, uh, Texas, as well as Walter Reed, uh, places like John Hopkins, um, Duke, UCLA, are doing studies and are continuing to do uh, research with this technology. Uh, and what we see is they do want to do a randomized controlled trial many times, double blind study, to show that this works better than a placebo. You know, who's to say that you can't just put the ear clips on and sit and relax for 20 minutes and feel very relaxed at the end of that as well? So we do have randomized controlled trials, and when we do that, we actually set up the devices in-house for placebo trials. And when we do that, we loan devices to the researchers. Uh, they're set to a subsensory level, so the patients actually don't feel the treatment. Um, you don't have to feel it to get a, a positive response. So we set it below uh, sensory, so they don't know they're getting a treatment. All they know is that they're wearing the ear clips. Uh, all the devices will beep and they count down, they act normally, but only half the devices actually work. The other half have a non-conductive component, so it looks like they're getting treatment, but they're actually not. So the patients are blinded to whether they're getting treatment. The researchers also don't know which devices are active. And once the study is complete, uh, they have a serial number key that they can unscramble and see who was active patients and who was sham patients when they do their mathematical analysis. We have a lot of good imaging studies, EEG changes in the brain, where we see more alpha, which is relaxation brain waves, and less Delta, for example, which is your uh, sleepy brainwave. So you're actually more alert and more relaxed, which is the effect. Uh, once you do the treatment, you feel very relaxed, but your mind's more alert, like you had a cup of coffee, without the jittery effect. These changes in brain activity can easily be seen in brain mapping studies, where blue indicates a reduction in delta waves, and red indicates an increase in alpha waves, after 20 minutes treatment with Alpha Stim CES. One of the things that we've been approached with with our Army practitioners that use a device, uh, they had an objective where they had to really talk about and discuss the amount of suicides uh, that occur in the military, which at the time was, I think, 23 a day was how many suicides were occurring, which is a staggering number. And they see that the antidepressants that they prescribe to many of these patients have an increased risk of suicidality. Uh, so as they're having to address those, they're also having to address what else can they do, what other options are out there that maybe don't carry those side effects. Good morning, distinguished panel members. My name is Dr. Kathy Platoni. I am a clinical psychologist, a colonel in the United States Army Reserve, and I am the Army Reserve Psychology Consultant, which you loosely translate to Chief Psychologist for the Army Reserve. 
However, I am here today as a civilian practitioner with substantial human experience in both the civilian sector and in the wartime theaters of both Iraq and Afghanistan. In my experience, without exception, there simply is no more powerful form of therapeutic intervention, either as an adjunct or as a standalone treatment than, al than Alpha Stim CES. In the wartime theaters of both Iraq and Afghanistan, and under the worst possible conditions that any, any human being should ever be forced to tolerate, Alpha Stim CES was the, was the single most effective form of treatment that our combat stress control team was able to provide to service members in our care. So CES has really stepped into that role as a non-drug, um, non-invasive, very safe option. In a placebo-controlled study published in 2014, 83% of people treated with Alpha Stim experienced a 50% or more reduction in anxiety and depression. We put a very high bar there. We said 50% improvement. Saying 50% is, is quite ambitious, and yet we achieved it. There's no drug study in anxiety that even comes close to that. But what about the side effects? What we see with our safety profile is that there's a less than 1% chance of side effect. And the most common side effect you get is a, a headache. And that's about one in a thousand patients will report a headache. The next is skin irritation at the electrode site, and that's about one in 1,500 patients. So in both cases, they're very mild and self-limiting. Uh, the headache is usually a myogenic, a muscular headache. You do relax muscles with the current. So when you're wearing the ear clips, you feel your jaw and your neck. Um, TMJ muscles, they tend to relax. So as those relax, you can actually induce a headache. Um, the headache's pretty short-lived, usually within 20 to 30 minutes after your treatment's over, that is resolved. Um, the ear clip, uh, skin irritation on the ear clip, it's usually someone who's very fair skin, red hair maybe, and you'll get some redness on that earlobe, and that clears up pretty quick as well. But those are the most common uh, side effects that we get. Now one of the effects you can feel from the current itself is vertigo, or some dizziness. And the current's going anatomically across your brain, obviously, but it's going through your earlobe. So what we actually do is we see that the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibulo cochlear nerve, is stimulated. And that handles your hearing and your balance. And as you stimulate that nerve and overstimulate that nerve, you can get some imbalance. It feels like you're rocking on a boat. So when patients get to that level, we just have them back it back down to back to where they're comfortable. Um, the dizziness subsides and then they wear it for the duration, which is 20 or 60 minutes. For comparison, according to the National Health Service in the UK, Antidepressant medications, in general, can cause vomiting, indigestion, stomach aches, diarrhea, constipation, loss of appetite, dizziness, insomnia, headaches, low sex drive, difficulties achieving orgasm, erectile dysfunction, dry mouth, blurred vision, problems passing urine, drowsiness, weight gain, excessive sweating, heart rhythm problems, agitated or anxious feelings, and suicidal thoughts. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft, the number one prescribed brand of its kind. Zoloft, when you know more about what's wrong, you can help make it right. What's interesting is we do a lot of medical conferences. We go to the, the appropriate ones, to pain conferences as well as mental health conferences. And what we find is uh, there's a lot of practitioners there and you get a rush of practitioners they want to learn about the device and try it so we do demonstrations and then you have a period of an hour or two where they're in lectures so usually you're standing around and we see that we get a lot of business from pharmaceutical companies their reps will come over and they may be depressed and they travel a lot so they don't sleep well um, they may have pain so they ended up using our device and they want to try it and they what they often tell us is that they really don't want to take the medications that they sell um, they're aware of the side effects and they hear from the practitioners that are asking them about you know, some of the dangerous side effects and they're also um, you know, educated on, on what's going on so they're looking for other things too. So a lot of the uh, business that we have are from people that actually work in the pharmaceutical industry that are knowledgeable about what can happen when you take those medications. Clearly, Alpha Stim offers a much safer form of treatment than the medications that are commonly used. But how is it possible that Alpha Stim has practically no side effects? The waveform of a medical device, an electromedical device, is analogous to the chemical ingredient in a drug. It doesn't matter if it's a five milligram white pill, it matters the chemistry in that white pill. And so a lot of people say, oh, microcurrent, you know, but, but that's just one small aspect of it. 
So the waveform is 10 seconds long. It expands and contracts in, 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 its, in its delivery of electricity. So you can make an analogy of strumming a guitar and moving your fingers all the way up and down the frets. The strings change and the frequencies change and you hear something different. Drugs are said to work by a lock and key principle. The drug is the key that goes into the receptor, which is the lock, unlocks the receptor. The receptor sends a message into the cell. It generally has two or three messages and it can send this message into the cell to control the life of the cell. It gets a little complicated because there's about seven million receptors on the average neuron. These things are really small. <laughs> and which receptors are activated in which way on the neurons determine who you are at a given time uh, in every way, health and disease, mental state, everything. We actually are finding that it's not the lock and key that was an 1800s mechanical model. It's not that it physically has to go in there. Even if it's in proximity, it'll work if the frequency matches. The drug has a frequency. All matter has frequency. Even though it's a, a physical something you can see, it still has a, 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 these kind of properties. And so the, the drug vibrates, uh, we call it a ligand at that point, vibrates in such a way that it can activate the receptor to change the function of the cell. You can make an analogy of using tuning forks. If I have a tuning fork and I tap it on something and I activate it and I hold it next to a, another tuning fork of the same frequency, the second one will start to vibrate just because they're in proximity, not touch it. If I have a tuning fork of a different frequency, it won't cause another one to vibrate. Just like if I talk to you in English, we can have a conversation. If you talk back to me in Chinese, you're going to lose my attention. Uh, I only know a few words. <laughs> uh, so, so the communication has to be the same frequency. So we provide a buffet of frequencies, uh, a wide range of biological frequencies. And, and within that range, the receptors take what they want for, or what they need. They figure out, uh, well, well, we'll take this frequency. Think of it like this. Um, I want to say hello. Uh, and I can say it in a hundred languages. And you only know one language or two languages. So in China, I say ni hao, hello, <laughs> and, and, and people understand me. In English, I say hello. But if someone said hello to me in Greek, I wouldn't have any side effect. I would just ignore it. So we're, we're saying hello to the cell, to the receptor. We're saying turn on in, in, in more than there are <laughs> languages. <laughs> and, and when we hit the right frequency, the receptor responds and it changes physiological function and there's no side effects. So I think this is, this should be the future of medicine. The interesting part about alpha stem is the waveform, the mechanism of action, if you will, it what makes a device work, has not changed in 34 years. So we've changed the buzzers, we've changed the whistles, we've gotten better in applying it and the protocols, are, our protocols are patented as well as the technology. So uh, we've improved how to use it, when to use it, where to put it. And some people think, well, electrical stimulators are all alike because physical therapists have been using applications of force uh, in nerve stimulators, muscle stimulators, uh, various types of stimulators. But the common denominator is there are applications of force and not trying to activate receptors like I was talking about. So more is definitely not better. We have to be at the level of bioelectricity. Cranial electrotherapy stimulation offers a safe and effective alternative treatment for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and pain. But in what other areas of medicine has electromedicine been shown to be effective? Members of the Senate, members of the House, ladies and gentlemen, we are here today for the purpose of signing the 
Cancer Act of 1971. On December 23, 1971, President Nixon signed the National Cancer Act, allocating enormous resources towards finding a cure for cancer. To provide the funds that are necessary, whatever is necessary, for the conquest of cancer. The president is totally committed. The president's influence, whenever necessary, can be used to reach this great goal. In fact, President Nixon originally planned to cut the cancer budget, but did a U-turn as a result of mounting pressure from doctors, scientists, and health advocates, including philanthropist Mary Lasker. The Cancer Act raised expectations about finding a cure for cancer within the next few years, and it wasn't very long before media reports started to prematurely question why a cure remained elusive. Tonight, the war on cancer. Are we winning? But the so-called war on cancer has now been waged for more than 45 years. So what progress has actually been made? There are, of course, many different types of cancer, so it's difficult to generalize. In the United Kingdom, for example, data published by Cancer Research shows that between 1971 and 2014, overall there was a 14% reduction in the number of cancer deaths. There are also specific examples of improvement. For example, leukemia survival rates in the UK have increased from 7% to 46% in the last 40 years. There has also been a reduction in the number of cancer deaths in the United States. However, further analysis shows that most of this reduction is not due to medications or treatments, but is a result of a reduction in the number of people who smoke cigarettes. Well, it's banned in the White House and just about every place else, it seems. And if the inconvenience of finding a place to do it is not enough to discourage, there's also a proposal for higher taxes. According to the New York Times, more than $100 billion has been spent on cancer research since the Cancer Act was signed. And the battle gets bigger every year. In 2012, there were an estimated 14.1 million new cases of cancer worldwide. By the year 2030, it's predicted that this number will increase to 23.6 million new cases of cancer each year. Perhaps it's time to consider additional treatment options. Could electromedicine provide solutions where medications have been limited? I think a lot of the use of electromagnetism in the past century was quackery, and uh, it was not really anchored in solid science or clinical data. I think what we're seeing in the 21st century is uh, some much more robust data, both in terms of basic and translational science, and especially in terms of uh, clinical results. Professor Boris Pash is director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center at Wake Forest University Medical Center and associate editor for the Journal of the American Medical Association. Professor Pash and his colleagues have developed a novel treatment that uses very low-intensity radiofrequency electromagnetic fields to target specific types of cancer. The device, known as the therabionic device, uses two waves, a carrier wave set at 27.12 MHz and a modulation wave that is specific to the type of cancer being treated. We initiated this research in 2001, and after a couple of years, we, uh, we were quite surprised to find that the same modulation frequencies were found over and over in patients with the same type of tumor, irrespective of their gender, their age, and their ethnic status. So it suggested uh, early on by 2003 that um, tumors might respond to some specific frequencies. The researchers used biofeedback in order to determine the frequencies that correspond to each type of cancer. Variations in the patient's pulse were measured as they were exposed to a range of different modulation frequencies. The results showed that people responded to specific frequencies depending on the type of cancer. Early studies showed encouraging results in a range of different cancers, including patients with metastatic breast cancer, and thyroid cancer. However, the research team are now focused on the treatment of liver cancer, medically called hepatocellular carcinoma. A large number of tumor types are untreatable or incurable, 
and novel approaches are sorely needed, uh, in particular for a treat the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the most rapidly growing tumor type in the United States. And for such tumors, uh, when we have we have limited option, it's clearly um, an area where novel ideas and novel uh, thoughts are needed to try to make a, a breakthrough in a disease that we otherwise treat very poorly. Most patients that have advanced hepatocellular carcinoma are very sensitive to many drugs because their liver function is impaired. And most chemotherapy drugs or even targeted therapies uh, need a well-functioning liver to be metabolized properly. So this is a major impediment for many therapies. What we have found is that patients even with impaired liver function seem to benefit from this novel therapy. So in the practical sense, this is a device that consists of two uh, units. One is the docking station that uh, charges the device uh, like your electronic toothbrush and that conveys to the device the authorization to be treated. This, the docking station will have a prescription card that will be uh, containing 100 treatments and that will be the way the patient will have the authorization to be treated. The docking station itself will be connected at the doctor's office to a server that will connect with uh, the company central server to make sure the proper program is given to the proper patient with the corresponding tumor and uh, ensure that everything is working properly. The patient will start the treatment by essentially pressing a button and as soon as the button is started the patient will place the mouse piece in the mouse like that and will keep the lollipop, as many patients have called it, in the mouth for one hour at a time, three hours per day. Uh, once the treatment is over, the patient will just place the device back on the docking station and the device will be ready for next treatment. An important feature of the Therabonic device is that it's able to target cancer cells and leave the healthy tissue intact, something that cannot be said, of course, for other types of cancer treatment, such as radiotherapy. That is correct, and uh, this is what we had observed in our early clinical experience. We have now conducted uh, experiments in the lab that confirm uh, the tumor specificity of these modulation frequencies. In other words, only tumor cells that are exposed to corresponding tumor-specific frequencies seem to be affected in, in, their, in their growth while there is no impact on uh, normal cells. What we've seen so far is that we've identified a phenotype is that there, we're getting it, proliferative inhibition, which means cells are not able to divide. So that means that something in tr within the cell genetically is potentially being modified. So in order to in investigate that and understand that, which is part of the mechanism of action, what we're doing is we're using um, techniques that are currently cutting edge and understanding the changes in uh, microRNAs. We're no longer looking at it from the 40,000 foot, 40, foot level, we're looking at it under a microscope now. Our understanding then becomes how the, the genetic changes in that cell are leading to the phenotype or the proliferative inhibition or the anti-cancer effect that occurs with the therabionic device. And so based off our data that we have so far, we're, we've noticed that there are certain gene cha genes that are changing, which in turn are indicative of certain pathways. And that in turn will lead us to understand how it goes from the exposure of your entire body head to toe to a single cell, in this, in this case a specific cancer cell, actually having a, a response which is incredibly beneficial for the patient. The patients that have been treated so far are patients that have failed standard therapies. Um, and in those patients, uh, we have found that there is a a certain degree of efficacy and especially long-term responses and what is particularly important without any side effects. First you treat patients that had no other option. It's called phase one of feasibility study. That's what we have done. Uh, then you move to phase two to try to gauge the level of efficacy and we have conducted these type of studies uh, and in hepatocellular carcinoma we have conclusive data showing efficacy. Uh, what we have not done yet is to compare this type of therapy either with no therapy or with one of the 
with standard therapies for hepatocellular carcinoma, and that would be a phase three, a randomized phase three study. As we've already seen with AlphaStim, the adoption of the therabarnic device requires an appreciation of the fact that where electromedicine is concerned, we no longer have a dose response. Traditionally, of course, medicine is used to the idea that a higher dose of the treatment will produce a greater result, both for the desirable effects of the medication and for the adverse effects. However, electromedicine involves the use of frequencies, and the results are not dependent upon a higher intensity. In fact, in many cases, very low-intensity electromagnetic fields produce the best results. The specific absorption rate, or SAR, is often used as a measure of the amount of radio frequency electromagnetic energy absorbed by the body when a particular device is being used. For example, Apple's iPhone 6 has an SAR of around 0.9 to 1.19 watts per kilogram. Actually, a very good point. So far, we've, as, as is published, we've um, our SAR levels have ranged from 0 0.03 all the way up to 1. Uh, milliwatt per kilo and we found that in that range there is no difference in the outcome which is the anti-proliferative effect which means that it's poten potentially there it, there's it's not limited to the dose but rather there's something specific about the the frequencies that we're using regardless of dose if you will or the SAR so not only are there a wide range of exposure levels that seem to have an effect on cancer cells, but the exposure levels associated with this effect are also less than one thousandth of the exposure typically generated by a mobile phone. The concept that low energies can produce dramatic results has also been corroborated by Professor Abraham Liboff. I took part in a treatment of a young man who was going to have his leg removed. And uh, what we did was to apply electricity to the break where the bone was disconnected. It was hanging, but disconnected from the rest of the body. This is called a pseudoarthrosis. A pseudoarthrosis is a, a non-union. And usually the treatment of sorts is to remove it, amputate it. We saved the bone by applying no more than a, a single dry cell a C battery to provide a microampere current between the two sides, the bone knit together in, ex in accordance with what was predicted by, uh, by Becker. Anyway, uh, this then stood as a uh, strange, unexplained thing because the currents were too small, not only with the currents we observed through so on, but the Japanese man called Yakuda working with a physicist, uh, Pukata, determined that nanoampere currents also led to the same reforming of bone. So the microampere currents that we used were reduced by a thousand fold and they still worked. Big mystery. It was such a mystery that the, the, the scientific community just paid no attention to it. It was just an oddity that Presented, but it presented something to a physicist that was very strange because the energies were just too small. You couldn't do anything. To a chemist, it was just the same thing. So that was the basis of how I came to be interested in this area. One possible explanation for very low intensity energies having dramatic biological effects is resonance. Earlier, we saw that alpha stim uses the concept of resonance and provides a range of frequencies for the brain to choose from. Resonance is a phenomenon that can be observed throughout physics. In order to understand the effects of resonance at the microscopic level, it can sometimes help to see how it affects things on a much bigger scale. You wouldn't believe possible unless you could see it as you do now. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State opened in 1940 and in the same year suffered a spectacular collapse. Twisting, turning, curling. On the day of the collapse, a steady wind was blowing at 42 miles per hour. The bridge was designed to withstand winds of up to 120 miles per hour, so engineers were initially perplexed as to how the structure could have collapsed. It turned out that the modest wind caused wind-induced vibrations that just happened to coincide with the bridge's resonant frequency. At resonance frequency, 
objects and particles oscillate with a stronger amplitude, and quite dramatic things happen. Professor Liboff discovered that certain resonance frequencies exist for biologically important charged particles within the body. Charged particles, or ions, for example, calcium, magnesium, zinc, and potassium, exhibit resonant frequencies when the appropriate magnetic field is applied. Now you have to realize this is the very first time ever there was a rational attempt to use physics to explain an ELF effect, electromagnetic effect. Up to that time, people had said it's good for you, it's no good for you, it can be used to do this, you can grow bone with it. But no one had ever sat down and tried to incorporate some physics into it. Well, because of that, I was pilloried. I was pilloried. People saw this as something which was crazy, impossible, and uh, I was sure of it because the numbers, as an experimentalist, I was completely sure of the numbers and how they fit in. You can tune it by changing the frequency to various ions, calcium, magnesium, zinc, whatever, depending upon the charge to mass ratio of the ion that's involved. When the ions resonate, they revolve at 90 degrees to the Earth's magnetic field a concept known as ion cyclotron resonance, and this has been shown to have a number of beneficial biological effects. It has been used not only to regrow bone properly, to see changes in EEG, the changes in blood that occur during aging. When you're 20 years old, your system operates so as to give you a very good immune system. By the time you reach 80, the immune system is not very good. So you can check this by taking blood, treating it with a certain lectin, and you see how many more blood cells are created, how many more lymphocytes are created from blood cells. With young people, it's a very rapid turnover. With older people, not. The Italians began looking at this in the 1980s and found that, indeed, when you apply these magnetic fields, very low energy magnetic fields, you see these wonderful effects whereby an 80-year-old's blood is basically taught to be more responsive and basically provides more immune. The list is like at least a hundred different experiments showing by tuning to various ions, you get these very strange and very profound differences in living things. All of the present descriptions, which are biological, or molecular biological, if you will, they, in this laundry list, include lipids, proteins, DNA, RNA, uh, cholesterols, and the whole list of things, this, this jungle of stuff that we describe living things with, our genes and so forth. Each of these can be characterized as having some sort of field attached to it. These are basically, to me, no more than electrical expressions, electromagnetic expressions, actually. And this is the way I think living things function. The problem is that a lot of people have vested interests in keeping the old paradigm alive because you can sell molecules. You can sell molecules and drugs. In America, it has been reported that 70% of people now take at least one prescription drug, and an estimated $330 billion is spent each year on medications. This has resulted in prescribed medications becoming a leading cause of death. The adverse effects of medications are now responsible for at least 106,000 deaths each year. You cannot get through the day without being inundated with drug ads. I mean, the, the, the economic difference is, is, is uh, you know, more than David and Goliath. You know, it's just a huge amount of money being spent uh, to sell you on drugs. And everyone, everything else is considered outside of the norm and so-called alternative medicine. Uh, 
uh, or complementary or integrative, which is a better term being used today. But it's different and, and it's not accepted. They accept new drugs very easily uh, as part of the whole program, but they don't accept uh, disruptive ideas like this is better than a drug but the drug are the standard, so how can anything be better than the drug? <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's a mindset. Our colleagues are looking at us and judging us all the time. We're being judged. So if we, if we, if we depart from the mainstream, we have a real problem because we're gonna, uh, the, the wrath of our colleagues will be visited upon us. So the human factor keeps us, keeps us aligned with the mainstream, even though we may know really know that there are some issues in the mainstream that are simply wrong and don't fit. And so this is a system problem. It's actually a problem that reflects our human nature. We want to protect ourselves, protect our reputation, uh, protect our um, standing in our scientific field. It's a very, very, very big problem that, that I think stands unrecognized. You know, you think that, well, truth will prevail, but truth will prevail if we're free to choose as, as we wish. We're not free to choose as we wish. In the case of the medical establishment, it's beyond just human nature. It's, it's that the, the various companies who have a stake in the economics of what's going on play a pretty major role. And I think most of us realize that. We've seen scandal after scandal in the pharmaceutical companies with drugs and astronomical prices. And, you know, so we understand their position too. They're a business, and every business wants to succeed, you know, and their desire for success conflicts with the desire to, to improve medical treatment. This is the crux of the matter, and that, that's why I think it's, uh, it, it's entirely possible that many new therapies come along and they run up against obstacles day after day. And, and, and so these almost obvious kinds of approaches to improving human health, they face the obstacles of the, you might say, the competition, the desire for these companies who stand to benefit um, economically uh, against the desire to improve human health. That conflict needs to be resolved if these kinds of therapies are to really gain traction. For me, I've been fighting the FDA for uh, over 25 years. And for example, uh, February 10th, 2012, there was a meeting in Washington of the Neurological Device Panel. And an epidemio a PhD epidemiologist at FDA, Laura Min, uh, said 25 uh, 22 times that day, there's a transcript, I counted it, uh, how the uh, cranial stimulation, brain stimulation, uh, electrical brain stimulation, uh, can cause seizures. Two cases of new onset epileptic seizure. I've heard this before, but I've never found a reference. So finally, and we weren't allowed to talk, we could just witness. And uh, finally, one of the panel members, the FDA's neurological device panel, asked, tell me more about the seizures. Um. The seizures occurred in a paper by Philip, and I can tell you that this was a study of psychiatric inpatients with major um, depressive disorder, and in this study, two patients had new onset epileptic seizures. New, new onset? They've never had one before, oh my God. And then she said, During a five-day washout um, period that occurred prior to CES treatment. <coughs> before the electrical stimulation was used, in a study, done in France on major de uh, depressive disorder, which they didn't accept as a study it, for proof that it worked for major depressive disorder, although it did, the study outcome was good. They ignored that because it was a foreign study. They didn't want to look at it at the time. But they did accept the side effect. But the side effect occurred before electrical stimulation. The article, the publication in the journal, made it very, very clear. So she said, stuttering. It's like the seizures are likely not attributed to the CES device, but we reported it here simply because we were reporting all of the adverse events that occurred in the studies. And I fell off my chair. Because I'm pretty sure that a PhD epidemiologist has a course, a class, <laughs> in before and after and understand the difference. And you can't have a side effect before the treatment and, call, and blame the treatment. So 
the arrogance of her. She didn't say, you know, I might have made a mistake there. No, no. She deliberately misled and lied to the panel. And the panel accepted all of this. There was two or three people on the panel that could have been, could have been um, honest. And they provided a, a bit of a yin to the rest of the yang in the panel, which was just going with whatever the FDA wanted to say. And, and this was a sad day for America. The FDA maintained that posture for 22 years. They finally gave it up on February 10th, 2012. They got caught and they dropped the uh, side effect of seizures. It was really in the late 80s, early 90s that food and drugs started to get their arms around how do you regulate medical devices. Um, uh, CES came to this country from Russia in the 1960s. Um, food and drug got control of devices and the regulation of devices in 1974. So they had to take devices that were on the market prior to that and figure out how to keep those on the market and how to allow new devices to the market and how to prove safety and effectiveness, basically. Um, so uh, CES was dumped into what they call Class Three back in 1978, and at that time they had 36 months to come back and officially categorize it, and they did not. Your typical class three devices would be your high-risk devices, so your implantables, those types of things. So CES is, is not an implantable. It is very safe. We have not had any uh, major adverse reactions in 34 years of commercial distribution, so it doesn't fit in the category of a high-risk device. And the ramification for a small company like ours in that regard is people then assume that if you're in class three, then you're high risk. Um, the other component that comes into that picture is insurance reimbursement, where insurance companies are not wanting to reimburse for a class three device. So it becomes a battle for a patient to say, you know, I know this works for me. I, I want to try it. I want to do this before surgery. I want to do this before medications, or maybe my medications didn't work. And now I'd like to try this before I have surgery or some other um, more invasive um, techniques. So um, it makes sense to try at least uh, invasive first, um, especially with our safety profile and with the efficacy profile that we see out there. In 2009, the, the Government Accounting Office said, okay, you guys, you've got 28 types of devices that you were supposed to correctly classify back in 1978, and you haven't done that yet. Get it done. So then they took these 27 devices and prioritized those and started to do their um, panel meetings and the call ups to look at reclassification. So that's what they, and I do believe they've been diligent in doing that since 09. There's been many um, types of technologies that have been reclassified. Um, and so they're working their way through them. Um, they haven't gotten to us yet. So we're, we're standing by. And we're basically in limbo. So we are uh, in both class three and class two. Our pain applications are class two. So those are a lesser uh, regulatory classification. The electrical brain stimulation is class three. And that is uh, the limbo that we have been in. Over the years, they've required um, many, many submissions of data, uh, clinical trials, of quality data, of marketing data which we've put together happily each time and submitted it only for them to make no regulatory move on it. Uh, so now we are uh, in limbo once again, waiting for them to downclassify CES into class two where it really should be. In 2016, the Food and Drug Administration finally issued a proposed order to downclassify CES for the indications of anxiety and insomnia. So in the end, instead of 36 months, it took the FDA 39 years to make this review, and the FDA has still not completed the review for the indication of depression. On the other hand, where drugs are concerned, the FDA typically completes the approval process within 10 months, and many drugs are given priority status, whereby they're approved within six months. It does seem that the FDA has a strong bias towards the approval of drugs. Anything else seems to be continuously delayed. This has a number of important implications for patients, since alternative treatments that have been shown to be safe and effective, and sometimes more effective than drugs, are unnecessarily restricted. 
Yes. The FDA is a rogue agency. They, they, they have no oversight. That Congress has oversight over them, but they don't really get to do much, and the FDA is not afraid of Congress. But the real problem with the FDA is they're dishonest. I mean, what they make a decision first, a political decision, economic decision, help their friends out, often do something for a drug company and then go to work for that drug company at a phenomenal rate. They've actually been revolving doors, and this has been on the news at times when, when for example, people, uh, someone from Monsanto. This guy epitomizes the revolving door. First, Taylor was a lawyer for Monsanto. Then he joined the FDA's deputy commissioner for foods. Then he went back to Monsanto and became its vice president for public policy. Yeah, I'm sure his FDA position didn't help open that door. But don't worry, he's now back in the FDA in the same cushy position as he was before, rubber stamping pro-Monsanto legislation. <laughs> what? This isn't supposed to happen. I mean, so it's a little bit too cozy. The pharmaceutical industry controls the regulatory agencies and the professional agencies. And the drug companies are not out to make us well. They're out to sell product. I have to say I'm not against all drugs. It's just that drugs are not the answer to everything. Sometimes drugs are good, but it's not a complete system of health care. And there are so many options and people don't think of them. And medical doctors throughout the world don't say, well, medicine doesn't do a very good job with this problem that you have. So why don't you try acupuncture, Ayurvedic medicine, or homeopathic medicine, or osteopathy, or something else? Uh, they don't say that. In fact, the understanding of the body electric has a number of interesting parallels with medical systems from the East. For more than 3,000 years, medical systems in the East have been based on the concept of a vital life force that circulates throughout the body. This vital life force is known as Qi in traditional Chinese medicine and Prana in the Indian Ayurvedic medical system. The same vital life force is also known as Qi in Japan and Gi in Korea. Qi is considered the subtle energy that moves the universe. It's found everywhere and is always present, before, during and after any change. In a similar way, changes in bioelectricity coincide with changes in health status. Therefore, the understanding of the body electric could bridge the gap that currently exists between the different approaches taken in the East and the West. There are effects occurring in the body which occur at remarkably low fields. The energies involved are lower. This led me to think in terms of subtle effects of the sort that people use key and G and the like. So I ask, is it possible that what they're seeing is the same as we are? That question still remains. That subtle effects as a con connected to the, the various effects that people see using alternative medicine might somehow be related to what we're talking about. To date, Western medicine has not accepted the concept of a subtle controlling life force. However, the effects that have now been seen in a wide range of different medical applications should lead to a re-evaluation of this viewpoint. In order to provide the best medical care for patients in the future, surely the medical profession should be willing to take a broader view on all of the possibilities rather than remaining entrenched in providing pharmaceutical interventions alone. When I first studied acupuncture, I was a teenager, and I thought, boy, I can go into the hospital and discharge half the patients if I treat them, uh, you know? And, and, and unfortunately, I haven't really seen medicine evolve, and it's such a missed opportunity, a system of healthcare that goes beyond treating, managing symptoms with drugs, but actually making people feel good. I mean, making them feel normal, well, healthy, and happy. And we can do all of those things. The problem we have now is that our medical system and our biological knowledge, they are completely obsolete. I think of the biochemical paradigm as something which has to be moved aside to something which is more field-driven, 
uh, more electromagnetic, more connected to the real physics which describes nature. We're left with this obsolete system that doesn't give us health, doesn't deliver health, because it looks at organisms as machines made of isolated parts, isolatable parts, molecular nuts and bolts, and you define diseases by the molecules involved. So we need a complete overhaul of the biological knowledge system and the medical system together.